The Jew's Breastplate My particular friend, Ward Mortimer, was one of the best men of his day at everything connected with Oriental archaeology. He had written largely upon the subject. He had lived two years in a tomb at Thebes, while he excavated in the Valley of the Kings, and finally he had created a considerable sensation by his exhumation of the alleged mummy of Cleopatra in the inner room of the Temple of Horus at Philae. With such a record at the age of thirty-one, it was felt that a considerable career lay before him, and no one was surprised when he was elected to the curatorship of the Belmore Street Museum, which carries with it the lectureship at the Oriental College, and an income which has sunk with the fall in land, but which still remains at that ideal sum, which is large enough to encourage an investigator, but not so large as to enervate him. There was only one reason which made Ward Mortimer's position a little difficult at the Belmore Street Museum, and that was the extreme eminence of the man whom he had to succeed. Professor Andreas was a profound scholar and a man of European reputation. His lectures were frequented by students from every part of the world, and his admirable management of the collection entrusted to his care was a commonplace in all learned societies. There was, therefore, considerable surprise when at the age of fifty-five he suddenly resigned his position and retired from those duties which had been both his livelihood and his pleasure. He and his daughter left the comfortable suite of rooms which had formed his official residence in connection with the museum, and my friend Mortimer, who was a bachelor, took up his quarters there. On hearing of Mortimer's appointment, Professor Andreas had written him a very kindly and flattering congratulatory letter. I was actually present at their first meeting and I went with Mortimer round the museum when the professor showed us the admirable collection which he had cherished so long. The professor's beautiful daughter, and a young man, Captain Wilson, who was, as I understood, soon to be her husband, accompanied us on our inspection. There were fifteen rooms, but the Babylonian, the Syrian, and the Central Hall, which contained the Jewish and Egyptian collection, were the finest of all. Professor Andreas was a quiet, dry, elderly man, with a clean-shaven face and an impassive manner. But his dark eyes sparkled, and his features quickened into enthusiastic life as he pointed out to us the rarity and the beauty of some of his specimens. His hand lingered so fondly over them that one could read his pride in them, and the grief in his heart now that they were passing from his care into that of another. He had shown us in turn his mummies, his papari, his rare scarabs, his inscriptions, his Jewish relics, and his duplication of the famous seven-branched candlestick of the temple, which was brought to Rome by Titus, and which is supposed by some to be lying at this instant in the bed of the Tiber. Then he approached a case which stood in the very centre of the hall, and he looked down through the glass with reverence in his attitude and manner. This is no novelty to an expert like yourself, Mr. Mortimer, said he, but I dare say that your friend Mr. Jackson will be interested to see it. Leaning over the case, I saw an object some five inches square, which consisted of twelve precious stones in a framework of gold, with golden hooks at two of the corners. The stones were all varying in sort and colour, but they were of the same size. Their shapes, arrangement, and gradation of tint made me think of a box of watercolour paints. Each stone had some hieroglyphics scratched upon its surface. You have heard, Mr. Jackson, of the Urim and Thummim. I had heard the term, but my idea of its meaning was exceedingly vague. The Urim and Thummim was a name given to the jewelled plate which lay upon the breast of the high priest of the Jews. They had a very special feeling of reverence for it, something of the feeling which an ancient Roman might have for the Sibylline body.